Welcome, everybody. And thank you for, for being here. Uh, I want to thank everybody who had a hand in making this talk happen. Too many people to name, but not the least of which is our esteemed speaker here today, Dr. Bloom. Um, and then before we hear from him, I just want to give you a, all a quick plug for our speaker series, um, which starts today. Um, and that's a, this is going to be the first of a series of events uh, that we are hosting here in SBM. Uh, as a form of outreach to our esteemed stakeholders, which includes alumni, students, faculty, donors, the local business community, and others, um, through a series of talks, panels, and networking events. Uh, and we're trying to showcase uh, our school's emphasis on thought leadership and cutting-edge business practices that we, of course, teach in our, our programs. Um, our other goal with these events is to keep you connected to SBM and NDNU and involve you in whatever ways your time and desires might allow. Uh, we're, we're shooting for about four to six of these a year. Um, and our next event will be scheduled for sometime in early fall, fall 2024. We're going to take a break over the summer here, sneaking one in here before the summer. And then we'll catch up with you again in probably late August, early September. So uh, we encourage you to come to as many of these events as you, you'd like to uh, and are able to, and feel free to invite others who might be interested in the topic. Um, and of, of course, if you have ideas for topics or speakers, or you want to be a speaker, or you know somebody who might want to be a speaker, or you have any other suggestions for these events, uh, please just get in touch with me. I will drop my email in the, I guess we're using the Q&A, not the, the chat, but it's basically the same thing. So I'll put that there at some point before we get off. And now on to our speaker for today. I'm going to just give a brief int introduction and then let him take the floor. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us Dr. Nicholas Bloom, who is the William Everly Professor of Economics at Stanford University and the co-director of the Productivity, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship Program at the National Bureau of economic research, among many other things that he, he does. Uh, Dr. Bloom has been researching and sharing his views on the impact of working from home for over 20 years. So even though it's kind of a new thing, he's been studying it for, for, for a long, long time um, and is regularly featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, CNN, and other major national and international media. And finally, he was elected to the Bloomberg 50 in 2023 for his impact on uh, WFH research, working from home research. So without further ado, and of course, we're presenting to you virtually in the spirit of the, to the topic of uh, du jour, we'd like to welcome Dr. Nicholas Bloom, uh, who will talk to us about the present and future of remote work. Dr. Bloom. Good, and thanks very much. Um, if you can allow me to turn on my video, I can even appear as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, I. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it right now. But uh, All right. Tanya, if you can do the honors on that, how, how do we do on the slides? Or I think I can share my slides. Okay. Hey, well, I, I, I'll, can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah, I just there's no me right now, but okay, I could start going. You have to trust me that I'm actually here. But uh, <laughs> we trust you. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. If you can, why do, if you're able to turn my video on, feel free to do that. But I'll just go ahead without any video. But I'm actually here. So um, I'm going to talk about the future of working from home. Um, so this, uh, you know, this is something oddly enough, as Jordan mentioned, I've been working on for 20 years. So it was pretty quiet before 2020, and then in the last four or five years, it's been uh, kind of crazy in terms of how much interest has been in it. So I'm going to. Uh, given the time, I'll be relatively fast, concise, um, talk about three different things, just data. What does it look like now? Talk about management. Uh, how might you manage hybrid particularly? And three quick impacts on the economy, including house prices and golf. If you play golf, uh, it's probably affected your golf game. So what do we know about work from home levels? So this is a chart of the level of uh, work from home in the US. So the number of full paid days folks are working from home. Before the pandemic's about 5%. So it happened, but it's pretty rare. Most, most people went in every day, week in, week out. I certainly did. Um, during the pandemic or lockdown, you know, many of us, probably most people listening were forced into fully remote. You can see 
it dropped back down. But the last year, year and a half, really since the beginning of 2023, work from home has stabilized. So if you're reading newspaper headlines or hearing that, you know, the return to the office is still ongoing or work from home is eventually about to end, don't believe it. It's been totally stable now for about the last year and a half. There's another way to look at it, which is swipe card data. So this is uh, occupancy rates in major US cities based on how many people are swiping into the office every day. That's kind of the inverse of work from home. And what you see here is swiping collapsed. So it was about 15% of pre-pandemic levels at the peak of the pandemic. I'm kind of amazed as to who was going in. There were some people, but hardly anyone. You can see again, swiping is rising, rising, rising as work from home falls over 2021, 20, kind of 22. By 23, swipe levels have stabilized. So they both tell you the same picture. Work from home now is kind of stable. So if you're predicting 25, 26, 27, you're in real estate, retail, and industry impacted by it, I would predict what we've seen for the last year is what we're going to see for the next two or three years. What about cross countries? I won't spend long on this. Uh, you can probably hear from my accent. Uh, I was born in the UK. Basically, we have different data from 34 countries. And what we see is English speaking countries, think US, Canada, UK, actually Australia, for example, have pretty high levels. Europe is a little bit lower. Um, Northern Europe has a bit more work from home than Southern Europe. Central South America is kind of similar. And then Asia is the lowest. So when I talk to multinationals, they all say, you know, it's the North Americans that are, uh, you know, Canadians and Americans that are still working from home. The offices are half empty. If you go to Asia, almost everyone's totally back. Then there's a big, big difference across groups of individuals. So if you look across the whole of the US, a bit over half, almost 60% of people can't work from home at all. So think of people in retail, you know, hamburger restaurants, uh, construction, manufacturing, teaching a lot of hospital work. These people have to go in every day, day in, day out. Second group, it's about 30%. It's probably most people listening. It's most, you know, university graduates, MBAs, et cetera. Professionals, managers are hybrid. You know, the most common would be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the office, Monday, Friday at home. And then there's about 10% that are fully remote. Mostly these folks are like, Date call centers, data entry, IT support, but there's some also, you know, elite coders. So to step back, only, you know, 40% of people ever work from home. The majority of Americans have to go to their workplace every day. It varies a lot by industry. Uh, tech is right up there. Tech is the highest level of work from home, which is why in the Bay Area, it feels like, you know, everyone's working from home. It feels like the SF and, you know, San Jose are half empty because they're so tech and finance heavy. If you go down to the other end, hospitality, food services, transport, warehousing, there's hardly anyone working from home in those industries. So, yes, it's here, but it's definitely not everyone. It's very concentrated in kind of graduate heavy, computer heavy type industries. Also varies over the life cycle. So what you see, interestingly, is uh, kind of early 20s, something like the ages of my kids or my undergrads. They like to go in the office often for five days a week. They say, you know, they want to socialize in the office. They want to get mentored. Uh, they also don't typically have great, you know, homes in the sense of, you know, there's five of them sharing an apartment and no one wants to work from home in their bedroom. As folks get into their thirties and forties, work from home rates rise a lot. Think of, you know, having young kids, a bit more money, move out to the suburbs in a house. And then as we go kind of 50 plus, it starts to drop back down again as we get to empty nesters. So this interestingly creates often real problems for companies when I talk to them because they say, you know what, all of these are, uh, you know, new hires, uh, they want to come in, they want to be mentored and socialized, etc. But I can't get my managers, my middle level managers to come in and mentor them. They want to stay home. And so it generates some real tension in companies. So why is it settled out that way? Well, there are four factors driving work from home choice. I'm really just going to talk about the first two because they're the big ones. Basically, happiness and productivity. A little bit on space. You know, you might have thought the big deal about work from home is you save office space. It does a bit, but the, with a hybrid in particular, it's hard to cut space because people are still coming in some days. And in talent, it does help you recruit people because they can come from further away. In fact, I had something in the Wall Street Journal this week talking about super, super commuters. So, you know, if you only have people coming in the office one or two days a week, they can drive from much further away. But let's talk on happiness. Big gain from work from home is really 
summarizing this chart, people value it about as much as an 8% pay increase. So I, you know, I really like it. It, it saves a lot of time, a lot of commuting, a lot, a lot less stress. This is a big deal. Uh, when I talk to companies, managers, I'm like, look, unless your employees are 8% more productive coming in five days a week, just don't bother. You know, they value it the same as an 8% pay increase that effectively saving you a lot of money by reducing turnover rates and making it easier to hire staff. And in fact, one study that's coming out next week in Nature is I did a big randomized control trial on a massive multinational trip.com and we randomized individual by individual whether they got to work from home two days a week or had to come in fully in person every day. And what we found is hybrid, which is, you know, working from home two days a week in this case, had no effect on performance. You know, productivity wasn't better or worse. Lines of code written wasn't higher or lower. Promotion rates, performance reviews, all totally the same. So there was, you know, no good, you know, on average, hybrid employees were just as productive as their, you know, randomly chosen colleagues coming in five days a week. But they're a lot happier and their quit rates fell by about a third. And the company, trip.com, looked at this data. You know, they're a massive company. They're worth $20 billion. They have 40,000 employees. They're quoted on NASDAQ. Trip said, um, you know, what's not to like? It's like productivity stays the same. It's no negative. We maybe save a bit of space by hybrid and we're reducing quit rates by a third. And they said each person that quits probably costs us twenty to $30,000 because we've got to go out and recruit and retrain and interview new employees and that's expensive. So they're like this, you know, this is a total no brainer and they rolled it out to the whole company. And this is kind of a perfect example of why hybrids become so dominant. So 80 to 90% of US firms are operating for managers and professionals on hybrid because it's profitable. So, you know, America is a capitalist economy. I mean, I think quite rightly so. And in a capitalist economy, what makes firms money tends to stick around and hybrid is definitely profitable for companies. So what about productivity? If you've heard people beating up on work from home, you know, you've heard Elon Musk or Jamie Dimon or David Solomon. Oh, I can start my video. So let's see if I turn up now. Um, Jordan, can you see me now? Yes, we see you in video. Thank you. Okay, great. So um, in terms of productivity, people kind of beat up on it. So what's, you know, what do we know? What does the research tell us? I mean, I've also talked to probably one, 2,000 companies and managers, you know, I've been working on this pretty much every day, day in, day out for the last four years. Um, so I want to be really clear. There's two very different things. One is fully remote when you're working from home day in, day out, week in, week out. And the other is hybrid, when you say just working from home on Monday, Friday, coming in three days a week. Fully remote on the left, there's a range of studies. It's a bit all over the place, but the average of it is probably negative, maybe 10%. So it depends how well managed it is and data tracking and training and all sorts of stuff. But, you know, it may be negative. People often ask me, look, if productivity was, say, negative 10% for fully remote, why on earth would anyone do it? And the reason they do it, and you know, Stanford's included in that, we have about 2,000 fully remote employees, is it's massively cost efficient. So imagine uh, you have fully remote employees, let's say they're 10% less productive. On the other hand, you don't have to pay for office space for them. That often saves about 10% of cost, and you can hire them wherever you want. So if you're sitting in the Bay Area, if you can now hire a fully remote employee, say in Mississippi, their wage rate may be 20, 30% less, or maybe Brazil or Mexico, or Argentina. So fully remote, the decision is really about profitability. And it turns out for many roles, certainly not all, but for many, think of like call centers, data entry, payroll, is actually very, uh, you know, very cost effective to do it. Organized hybrid on the right, the evidence on productivity, there's a bunch of papers. I have one coming out in Nature next week, finds it's about zero. So it's not better, it's not worse. You know, I could discuss it for a while, but the upsides of getting to work from home two days a week is you save a couple of you know, days of commuting, you have a bit more time, you're less tired, it's quieter at home. So those are positives. The downside is less face-to-face -face connectivity, maybe a bit less training, a bit less innovation. Turns out on average, those two kind of net out to zero. So um, what about managing it for anyone, you know, managing individuals, teams, groups, and hybrid? You know, one piece of advice, I always say, look, there's two big pieces of advice. The first one is coordination. So when you survey people, 
and you ask them, look, what are the big benefits of coming into your office? Why would it ever be worth commuting into the office? And, you know, millions of people do every day. They say the key things I want to socialize with coworkers. I want face to face collaboration. Notice FaceTime with my manager is way down there. Better equipment, qua. I mean, basically, people come in to work to see their colleagues. Uh, that's the big driver. Now, as soon as you realize that, you think, look, you want to coordinate. And in fact, that's kind of what's going on. It's generated what's called the hybrid squeeze. So most people are coming in for three days a week. The typical company is saying, look, we want you all in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Stay home if you like, Monday, Friday. As a result, offices are still pretty busy midweek. They're just totally empty on Friday and kind of pretty, pretty empty on Monday. So one piece of advice is if you're going to have hybrid, coordinate. Make sure team by team or the whole company comes in on the same day because you know if Jordan and I are working together there's really no point him in on Monday me on Tuesday him on Wednesday etc the thing that when you talk to employees sends them mad is to say I spent you know 40 minutes driving in I had to get ready for work shave you know put on makeup whatever and then 40 minutes driving back and I spent all day on zoom like what a waste of time that's the thing that sends people crazy so when you do hybrid you want to make sure people come in on the same days you know offices are kind of being a uh, Updated a bit, cubicle land is going out, long corridors of individual offices are going out. What's mostly coming into offices is more meeting rooms, small and large, and what I call kind of quiet nooks or places where people can work, maybe take a Zoom call. The modern professional manager, if they're in the office for say eight hours, is probably, you know, four or five hours of that are in meetings, lunch, meeting other people, kind of social activities, but certainly two, three hours is quietly doing email, but between meetings, taking Zoom calls with, you know, clients, other offices. So you need more meeting space, but more quiet, you know, little nooks and crannies. What's been got rid of is cubicle land. That is really shrinking fast. The other so what is the importance of performance reviews. So to step back, think of 2019. When you're in the office in 2019, if Jordan's managing me, he can see if I at my computer typing away, you know, when he walks by, do I look like I have Excel or Word or, you know, Python or whatever, C++, whatever I'm supposed to be doing? Is it on my computer screen or when he walks past, am I watching the Champions League or Netflix? So basically, you can do what's called management by walking around. So it's kind of five out of 10 management. It's OK. It's not great. It's not disastrous. It's kind of livable. You can do that in the office. So, you know, for decades, we, a lot of firms use management by walking around. They effectively evaluate inputs, how much time you're putting into your job. Problem is, when you're working from home, there is no way to evaluate inputs. Jordan can't tell if I'm at home really what I'm doing. He could get surveillance software, keystroke monitoring. You know, it's pretty creepy. People really dislike it. I really would not advise anyone to do it, which means he kind of just he doesn't really know what I'm up to. It's kind of hard. Sure. Do I respond to emails quickly? But that's about it. And so. The big thing that you really need to do is focus on outputs and outcomes. And so there's been an enormous push towards performance evaluation. So if I'm working for Jordan, he would say, look, Nick, you're working from home Monday, Friday. You kind of run the show, but I am going to evaluate you typically every six months to make sure, you know, your teaching gets done, your research gets done, your university administration gets done, your tasks get done, et cetera. The kind of roles that you want to be doing. I may even give you more frequent feedback. For him, for Jordan, my manager is a lot better because he doesn't have to breathe down my neck. He can kind of trust I get on with things. And actually for the employees, for me, it's better too because I can say, hey, look, I'm going to go pick my, you know, my eight-year-old up from school. Uh, I'll pop out for half an hour. I can do that. I maybe want to go play golf, go to the dentist, whatever. I can do all of those things as long as I make up for it in the evening. So it gives me, the employee, greater flexibility and freedom. And it gives Jordan, my manager, kind of assurance and you know trust that I'm getting on with my job and of course if I doesn't if I don't you can fix it much faster so you know that's kind of the two points of management coordination and performance reviews finally what are three impacts on the economy um you know one I start with the food theme is the donut effect so about a million people have left the center of big U.S. cities and moved out to the suburbs why is that well I mean I'm sure most of you can guess if you only have to come into the office two, three days a week, you do not leave to live in the center of town. You can live further out. And as I mentioned, there was a piece out this week in the Wall Street Journal on super commuting, which 
do is that based on our research, it shows that people are now commuting in for massive distances, but they're only doing it two or three days a week. So if you think of the Bay Area, I can now live in Central Valley. It's, you know, land's a lot cheaper there. I can, can maybe get a house rather than a small apartment, have a horrendous journey in two days a week, but the other three days a week, I get a home office. You know, if I have young kids, say, space for my kids to go play. That donut effect really kicked in in 2020. People fled big cities. They moved out to the suburbs, of often the same cities. Most of them moved out to the suburbs, same cities. They have not come back. So one thought was, look, in 2020, sure, there was the lockdown, people would move out, but they return when the lockdown ends. From this data, we get data from the United States Postal Service change of address database are a million, you know, it covers all Americans. They are just not moving back into cities. So one change is about a million Americans have moved from the center of big cities into the suburbs, typically of the same big cities. It's not only pushing up house prices out in the suburbs, apartment prices have gone way up. So, you know, in the Bay Area, anything, central San Francisco, central San Jose, property prices have not done that well, but the suburbs have really taken off. It's also affected spending. So this is other research with MasterCard. And we looked at spending in central San Francisco, in fact, looked at spending zip code by zip code across the country. And again, you see the donut effect. Spending's down in downtown San Francisco. People are not living there, so they're not spending as much. They're also not working there, so they're not spending as much. But instead, they're getting, you know, their coffees and their bagels, their sandwiches, and, you know, they're shopping for their spouses in lunchtime out in the suburbs. So move one is the donut effect. Fact two is people are now living further from work. So this is research with Gusto. It's a big payroll company. It's based in uh, San Francisco. And from this, we know where people live and where they work. And what we see is people are moving further away from work post-pandemic, quite a lot further, roughly twice as far away on average. What's this been driven by? It's mainly been driven by new hires. So if you look at people hired pre-pandemic, yes, they're moving away, but not in huge numbers. You know, if you think about yourself, I don't know many people have moved further away from work, some, but not many. Mostly it's new hires. So what companies are saying is, look, if folks only need to come in two days a week, we can think much further afield about where we hire. Say if you're in, you know, Redwood City, pre-pandemic, you may have hired people just that lived, you know, south of San Francisco, and north of San Jose, because they got to drive in every day. Now they're only going to come in two days a week. You're like, wait, you know, we can go way north of San Francisco, below San Jose, back out into Central Valley, hiring people that live further away. So sure, we got a bunch of super commuters, but they've only got to do that twice a week. Finally, the golf effect. Now, I don't play golf, actually. I've tried, I tried to learn, you know, many years ago, but I was just terrible and I never really got the hang of it. But I spoke to so many managers and employees that told me, um, you know, the golf courses were coming rammed that I decided to do some research on this. So uh, with another co-author, Alex Finham, we used the Inrix GPS data and we define playing golf. It has millions of journeys every day. We define playing golf as driving to a golf course and spending between two to six hours there. So it's not perfect, but, you know, very few people walk or bike to golf courses. And, you know, it's hard to think of what else you'd be doing between two to six hours at a golf course. You're not living there and you're probably it's probably too long for lunch. So what you see here is in 2019, people are playing golf on the weekends. Less in the week it happens, but it's less common. 2022, 2023, there's an explosion of golf. It's kind of jammed all day, every day. Here's the alley numbers. It's incredibly uh, you know, high. Before the pandemic, people play golf in the morning and then slip off into work. 2022, it's basically high all day. This is August data. The reason it drops between 1 and 2 p.m. is it's just so hot in the south. It's just unbearably hot. You can't play golf then. But basically, the golf courses, when we've talked to people running, them, they just say they're just jammed, like they're now totally full. And what's going on is people are working from home. And they're getting their job, their work done. Most I talked about how hybrid is not damaging productivity, but they're playing golf a bit during the day. And, you know, I think that's fine. They're getting their job done at, you know, in the evenings, on the weekends and other days. I think the important fact to this is one is for anyone managing, some of your employees are probably in this database. So this is why performance management really matters. And secondly, this is not just golf. This kind of golf effect is boosting midweek demand for many leisure activities things like pickleball hair salons you know shopping malls out in the suburbs gyms i mean gyms you know they were cursed in 2020 nobody wanted to go into a sweaty indoor gym in the middle of a pandemic 
now they're really booming because there's a lot of demand of people want to go to the gym midweek. So a given gym can run more people through over the week and therefore make more money. Um, you know, yoga studios, even dentists, even dentists are doing well. You can, it's more easy to visit the dentist if you're working from home. So what about the future? Um, you know, I wrote a piece in The Economist last year. I predict what I call a Nike swoosh. Basically, work from home dropped a bunch. It's kind of stabilized now. And in the long run, it's going to slowly pick up. Why the big driver in the long run, I'm thinking five, certainly 10 plus years, is better technology. So technology, think of cameras, uh, you know, audio. Yesterday, I actually went up to San Francisco, spent half a day with a company that makes portals. They're eight by eight foot huge screens with cameras in the middle. And, you know, we, Jordan and I could like have life size meetings and I could see his whole body, him walking around. It, it just felt more lifelike. And this is the kind of thing, holograms. I met a, a company that was starting up the hologram business. This is what's coming down the pike. So, you know, looking five years out, working from home is actually going to be more common than it is now. And in fact, you know, we put a piece out in Harvard Business Review last year where we surveyed about 500 US managers and they said the same thing. They said, look, work from home is clearly well up from before the pandemic. And if you look five years out, their view is it's going to be a, you know, the same as what it is now, if anything, higher. So to conclude, work from home is here to stay. This is the new normal. If anyone tells you the return to office is still ongoing, you know, that's just not true. That's, you just do not see that in the data. It's been totally stable now for 18 months. I mean, the big thing looking forward is for hybrid, particularly, which is the hardest to manage, coordinate days in, make sure people have performance and management reviews. Finally, you know, in the long run, work from home is going to start growing again, as it was for, you know, 50 years pre-pandemic. And I should say I'm on LinkedIn. Please reach out and connect up and I'll uh, stop and go to Q&A. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bloom, for an excellent presentation. Very informative. And uh, we have a few minutes for, you know, we would have, would have had more if we didn't have the glitches, but we still <laughs> have a few minutes. So let's do some q and I'm going to invite everybody to, since you, we can't see you, just put your question into the chat. I'm oh, sorry, into the Q&A, and I will read aloud the questions to Dr. Bloom, and he will answer them. So let's give everybody a few seconds. But Jordan, I'll share the slides. You, I'll send you as soon as you're off the call. In fact, I can probably do it now. You know what? If anyone wants the slides. I think uh, you can do it right through the Q&A, I think. Yeah, I can do it through the Q&A. So right now, this is the one of, you know, doing this remotely. There, normally it's better. Here we go. So I put the Dropbox link. You're welcome to take those slides. If anyone wants to, there is no IP on them. As an academic, you know, I don't have any ownership on these things. So if anyone wants to use the slides or share them on, you're welcome to. All right. Let's see. Any questions coming through? Well, I'll start with one, with one since everybody can hear me. I won't put it in the chat. Um, what What is your knowledge about kind of, you know, the, the RTO mandates where the, the you're saying it's it's not backing off. Uh, sorry, it, you know, return to work is not happening like they thought it might. But then you see companies like Facebook calling workers back and threatening to fire them or actually firing them if they don't come back. So, do you have any any thoughts to to share on that? Yeah, totally. So, um, th the issue is it's to do with the incentives for journalists. So, I know and talk to tons of journalists all the time. Their incentives are to write stories that people read, click, pass on, you know, comment on, et cetera. So if you're a journalist for New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, that's really what you're after. Good stories, but ones that people read. The issue is everyone likes to read kind of shock and outrage stories, which is basically RTO. So what you find is a story goes out on Twitter or LinkedIn, says that, I don't know, Zoom is calling people back. People are like frantically clicking on it, commenting it, sending it around. The thing, you know, explodes. Journalists are really happy. If instead you say company X like Allstate is getting rid of the offices and people are going to, you know, more work from home, everyone's like, yeah, or whatever, you know, and they move on and scroll don't, and don't click in it. So what's happening is very unrepresentative coverage. So we know from big data, there is many firms calling people back as there are firms relaxing, letting people increase their work from home. But you just don't read it. It's kind of like the, what I call the shark attack phenomena. You know, no one writes a newspaper article saying no shark attacks on, you know, in America today. But as soon as there's one, the newspapers will cover it. So that's why when you read the paper, it kind of feels like that. Read the media. In practice, it's been, you know, it's stalled out really since, you know, the last 18 months. Right. Okay. So we have another question. 
Um, Slack did studies in 2021 and 2022 of tech workers and found consistent results, but looked as well at race as a considering factor with people of color expressing greater satisfaction with remote and hybrid work than white workers. Have you also looked at race and sex as well as age when looking at preferences? Yes, so um, we have re really very good data on gender, actually. So the paper on nature that's about to come out next week shows that, we, I mean, we've seen this in many surveys and many different setups. Women have a higher preference to work from home than men. It's not massive. I don't want to overplay the difference. But yeah, women do have a slightly higher preference to work from home, particularly women in their 30s and 40s. And it looks like it's correlated with childcare. Um on race, I, I, I twist the question slightly. So what we did is we surveyed people and asked them, are you a minority? We actually didn't use that word. We just said, is less than 10% of your co-workers the same gender, race, age bin, which is by decade, like 20s, 30s, 40s, et cetera, politics and religion. And what you see is folks that have less than 10% of their co-workers in any of those bins are slightly keener on working from home. And the interpretation from talking to a lot of employers is, I, I might take, you know, I'm clearly not a minority on pretty much any of those definitions. But if, say, I was working in a tech startup that was all 20 somethings and I'm 51, and they don't need to be aggressive towards me. They just all talk about TikTok or, you know, stuff I don't honestly understand. I'm just a different, uh, you know, age range. You know, I could be their parents kind of thing. And so I just feel less comfortable at work. I just, you know, I don't kind of get the vibe of my coworkers. So, we see that. Another piece of research I'm doing, actually I was talking about it earlier today, the biggest group, the by far the largest gainers are Americans with a disability. There we've seen absolutely enormous, really positive impacts on the ability to work and the preferences to work. And the reason is working from home, A, avoids the commute, which if you have a disability can be pretty punishing, and B, actually allows you to control your working environment. So if I have a really bad back, for example, can lie on a bed maybe and have, you know, have a setup that the laptop is, I, I lie on it. Or people with colostomy bags or kind of, sat, you know, one of my family members has a real issue of background noise and that allows her to sit in a quiet environment. So the biggest group of all, and it's been very positive, is Americans with a disability have seen extremely large increases in work rates afforded by the ability to work from home. Excellent. Okay. Any other questions come in the chat? Not someone, asked, someone asked about my golf game. I have to yeah. say my golf game is terrible. Uh, <laughs> it's really bad. I did. I worked at McKinsey, the consulting firm, years ago, and I thought it would be really useful to learn to play golf with the clients. But I, you know, spent about a thousand pounds on uh, golf lessons and got precisely nowhere, and so I've just kind of given up ever since. Uh, so I, I, the reason I have to study on golf is just so many people told me that uh, they were saying, "Oh my God, you can't get a golf." Round in anymore it's like packed they, people would say things like i used to play on tuesday mornings but now it's completely jammed all day every day <laughs> guess you have to find another sport to, to substitute for golf then all right yeah i mean i i think actually my take i've talked to a lot of companies i think it's been very positive for what i'll call kind of the leisure economy so not so much leisure kind of like the <laughs> You know, this is about 25% of the economy. This is an enormous part of it. But a lot of stuff is half empty during the week. You go to suburban shopping malls, dentists. My granddad was a dentist, actually. Uh, hair salons, pickleball courts. Nobody's using them. That used to be the case in 2019. Now, they're actually much more heavily used throughout the week. And it makes these businesses more profitable. Which in the long run means that, of course, there'll be more golf courses, more pickleball courts. Because if they're profitable, you open up new ones. So I think in the long run, Weirdly, this is going to be a huge boom for this kind of activity, as much as it's not great for commercial office space. But it's not like the economy suffered. It's twisted. You know, leisure stuff has kind of done well. And things like city center office buildings have not done as well. OK, um, we're at the five o'clock hour. Can we throw in one more question? Yeah, go ahead. I'm a professor. I always like questions. Yeah. All right. Uh, great presentation. This really helps us determine our hybrid work from home strategy. Uh, are there any studies on how frequently employees should be in the office once a month, twice a month, et cetera? That is a very good question. I, so first answer, no, there are no really, you know, there are no really definitive studies. I'll give you some guidelines. So the first guideline is kind of obvious, but just to lay it out, it critically depends on the task. 
So at one extreme, if you're a burger flipper, you clearly have to go in and flip burgers. At the other extreme, if you're in a call center and you've been doing the same thing for five years, that's kind of a perfect setup for remote work. You have the headset on, you can monitor everything, number of calls, they have 1% listening rate to get quality. So, and in between, for someone like me, I clearly teaching has to be, well, we do teaching in person at Stanford, uh, research meetings, presentations, much better in person. I often find one-on-one -on -one meetings, reading, writing, I mean, I actually was earlier just read, proofreading something, had to do it on paper. That's better uh, at home. So I think it depends a lot on the task. Even within the task, it also depends a little bit on, on, on seniority. So if you're new, so think the first couple of years, certainly first year, it's probably better to spend more time in person because you're up the learning curve. For a typical organization, so I'll just give you an example of Stanford because it's actually relatively representative. We have 20,000 employees. So we're a huge organization because we have two big hospital systems and the university and they're kind of a weird sports complex and stuff. Of them, about 50% just come in every day. So food service, security, cleaning, transport, et cetera. This is a, we, those just cannot be done remotely. Um, at the other extreme, there's a couple of thousand people are fully remote, which may seem surprising, but things like HR, payroll, some payroll, call centers, data entry, things that they don't really need to be on campus, IT support. And if they're off campus, we can hire them, say, in you know, the southeast of the US, where we can get much better people for this pay rate. And then faculty and staff like me tend to come in about two, three days a week. My sense is two to three days a week is, you know, maybe two, three, four is probably enough. Once you go below two days a week, you're facing a trade-off. It's not obviously better or worse, but you start to lose some connectivity. On the other hand, you can hire people from further away. And once you're down to one day a week, you probably might as well get rid of the office and just hire it as needed. So I'm involved. I'm an advisor, an investor in some startups, small companies, and they are mostly remote. I think that makes sense. They, you know, they save them a lot of costs. They do pay to meet up every so often, once a month. These are people that have been working, you know, five, 10, 15 years. They're pretty engaged, pretty motivated. So I think it depends really on what you're up to. But for a typical manager professional out there, the vanilla kind of most common version is in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, working from home Monday, Friday. Um, oh, activities I enjoy doing. I just saw that come through. Uh, you know, drinking beer, sleeping, <laughs> not working. Uh, you know, there's that old saying, there's nothing more fun than watching other people work. So if I can, you know, if I can uh, have a beer sitting on a deck chair watching someone else mow the lawn, that's a lot of fun. No, I mean, seriously, I spend, I spend a lot of time with my kids, I have to say. So work from home for me. I mean, I mean, I was like in earlier today. I shared lunch with a bunch of our students today, our undergrads. But uh, yeah, I mean, no, nothing very exotic. I, I don't I run a bit, but, you know, I don't, I don't have any particularly exotic or exciting uh, activities. I quite like seeing my kids and I like lazing around drinking beer, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, well, up to you if you want to conclude or answer more, up to you. I probably better go because it's already 5.05. I'm sure yeah. everyone's in the Bay Area. It's like unbelievably hot. I'm like sweltering, I guess. Jordan, you have the same thing. We're like in the middle of this heat wave. That I'm also downstairs. That's the, you know, I have a my the spare room in our house got converted into my work from home office. So this is about the only angle that looks respectable. If I tilt the camera down, you can see there's like a bed and all kinds of stuff. So, But it's also incredibly hot. So I'm going to melt, I think, if I spend uh, too much more time in it. Well, that's the other advantage of working from home is you can control the exact temperature of the air conditioning or the heat. Yeah, if you have air conditioning. We <laughs> do not have air. You know, that's one reason to go to the office. They have air conditioning. But I don't know if you saw yesterday, uh, Stanford, had, we kind of had semi-lockdown because some protesters occupied the president's office. So yesterday, for most people, it was a work from home day. Right. Okay, well, uh, thanks everyone for being here. I apologize again for the, the snafu at the beginning, but this was, a, I think, a great session, ultimately. And we hope to see you at future events. Thanks to Dr. Nicholas Bloom again uh, for a fantastic presentation and uh, have a great rest of the afternoon, whether you're working in the office or from home. It's all good. Thanks for being with us. Great, thanks very much, Jordan. Thanks for setting it up. Take care.